So welcome uh, from MIND to our webinar today, exploring our strategic priority audiences through a physical activity lens. My name's James Durkin. I'm the Young People's Lead as part of MIND's physical activity team. And I'll be co-hosting today's webinar with Carla. Hi all, uh, great to be part of the webinar today and see so many people joining. Um, I'm Physical Activity Communities Lead in the Physical Activity Team, James with MIND. Brilliant, thanks Carla. We've also got three guest speakers joining us today. So we've got River, we've got Sam and we've got Niall and they'll introduce themselves as we go on through the webinar. Today we'll be running through some of the key insights from our strategic audience research and our guest speakers will be sharing their lived experience as we explore the relationship between physical activity and mental health. We are recording today's webinar and afterwards we'll be sharing the recording as well as the links to our report. I think the chat should be enabled soon so please do engage throughout and we'll also be holding a short bit of time at the end for a Q&A. So if you have any questions please use the Q&A function and if we're not able to answer your question during the session then we'll follow up after the webinar. Just before we do kick off, um, it's worth reminding you to look after yourselves during this webinar. If you do find any of the content triggering, we'd encourage you to reach out to Mind's info line on 0300 123 3393 or the Samaritans on 116 123. We'll post those links and numbers in the chat. And you can also visit mind.org.uk um, for further information on how to access support. And of course, feel free to leave the webinar at any point. It is recorded or take a break if you need it. We've got lots to cover in the hour, um, but before we do, we wanted to outline a few learning outcomes that we hope we'll cover throughout the webinar. So firstly, we want you to develop your understanding of the relationship between physical activity and mental health of our strategic audiences as we provide you with access to new evidence and insight. Our guest speakers will also draw on their lived experience as we share some of the barriers faced by young people, racialized communities and people in poverty when those audience are engaging in physical activity. As people continue to introduce themselves, it's great to see where you're coming from. I'll pass over to Carla to talk through a bit about our research and our audiences. Oh, thanks, James, uh, and morning, everyone, again. Um, so talk a little bit about our strategy. So in 2021, we launched our new Mind strategy, which identifies three audiences we will prioritise moving forward. These audiences are people from racialised communities, young people, and people living in poverty. And as part of our strategy launch, we committed um, commissioned dedicated research with and then the Unmistakables and 2CV really looking into the mental health experiences of our priority audiences. And we know from this research, our priority audiences are both disproportionately impacted by inactivity and mental health problems, and therefore will be a key focus for us in the, in the coming years. And before we kind of really go into and explore the research findings in more detail, I wanted to share that we recognize there's no one single way to describe poverty. And it's different in every situation, but it means um, struggling to make ends meet and how that impacts on our daily life. And there's also no one size fits all language for talking about race and identity. Group labels can bundle many identities and experiences together. This obscures the fact that people in these groups don't all have the same experiences of race and we don't all face the same challenges. So we choose the, the terminology racialized communities in our strategy but we know that our language is constantly evolving and the words that we choose matter um, and really must grow with us. So with Sport England Investment, we were also able to capture insights and recommendations relating to the sport and physical activity. And today we're really excited to launch our summary report of mind strategic priority audiences through a physical activity lens. And we'll be sharing insight on the relationship between physical activity and mental health, the barriers, and recommendations to better support the mental health of each audience through physical activity. We'll share a link to the summary report with you today for you to access after the webinar. And I'll hand back over to James to share an insight on our findings for young people. 
Brilliant. Thanks, Carla. So we're starting today by looking at the research findings about supporting young people, which explored the experiences of those aged 11 to 25. This project was conducted by the research agency and then. So I'm joined by River, a young person who is a member of Minds Youth Voice Network. River has supported our physical activity team's work over the past few years by co-designing resources for anyone delivering physical activity sessions to young people. Before I pass to River to share their experiences, I'll just touch on some of the insights that emerged from the research around young people's relationship with physical activity and mental health. So our research highlighted that most young people understand the link between physical and mental health. However, there's a difference between understanding and experiencing the benefits of physical activity on mental health. Unless young people talk about regularly participating in physical activities for their mental health. Instead, they perceive it as a short term solution. Ultimately, we know it's about the right activity at the right time and in the right environment. I think, interestingly, nearly two thirds of young people say that taking part in physical activity does have a positive impact on them. However, this number is lower for certain groups. We also saw that role models such as sports coaches play a key role in supporting young people's mental health. For example, for young males especially, they feel more confident having a conversation about how they're feeling with a coach. And this isn't always the case with a teacher or parent. I think at this point, I'd like to bring in River, who will share their relationship with physical activity and take us through the barriers identified as part of mind scoping research. So River, over to you. Hi everyone, thank you for coming today. My name's River Solis. My pronouns are they, them. I am non-binary and autistic. So for me, getting active actually helps to get me out of my head. It's a healthy distraction from negative thought patterns. And I definitely notice a decline in my mental health when I'm not active. My energy levels are much lower and my motivation is a lot less. I actually used to be very involved in team sports at school, such as netball, hockey, tennis, swimming. I started to discover my sexuality and identity, and then I no longer actually felt comfortable in those spaces. So it's unsurprising, as James pointed out, that the number is much lower for young people who identify as LGBTIQ+. As a non-binary person, I didn't know where I fit in, as most sports teams are separated by the binary genders. I decided to start exploring more solo activities, such as yoga and going to the gym, as this actually felt safer for me and more accessible. I got involved in this project because I know from experience that the impact that physical activity can have on our well-being is massive. And when I stopped doing these team sports, I lost a sense of community and team spirit. So I found it really hard to motivate myself to stay fit and to stay healthy. I wanted to share my experiences in the hope it would help young people today to feel more comfortable and able to participate in team sports, no matter how they identify. So when we look at barriers to using physical activity to improve mental health, there's a lot to cover. When it comes to body image, many young people struggle to love their body and spend a lot of time worrying about their appearance, often focusing heavily on perceived flaws. This is largely due to societal beauty standards that are reinforced on a daily basis through all the content that young people consume. So whether that's online, on social media, magazines, TV, film, we often see the spotlight on able-bodied, slim people with Eurocentric features, meaning society still favours Western beauty ideals, including being thin and tall, having long hair, having light tan skin, small nose, large eyes, high cheekbones, the list goes on, and it creates unrealistic standards for our bodies from a very, very young age. And furthermore, we see sports campaigns, gym advertising, any sort of content that's health and fitness related. It only represents a specific demographic most of the time. 
And this does not encourage young people of all backgrounds and abilities to get involved in physical activity. It actually just sends a message that to engage in physical activity, you have to already have a certain body type. When it comes to a lack of safe spaces, it's really important to consider first, what do we define as a safe space? When it comes to getting young people involved in physical activity, we need to take an intersectional approach. Is the session accessible for disabled and neurodivergent folks? So people whose brains function differently, like those with ADHD, autism, different learning needs. Are the activity coaches racially diverse and gender diverse? We need to address the needs of young people and create spaces that support and uplift their identity. It's really exciting to see that there are actually now more inclusive activities for people like me to get involved in. For example, like this time last year, I got involved in Misfits, which is a free fitness program run by the charity Not A Phase. It caters to the trans plus community by providing them the safe space to empower those that have been conditioned to shrink. At the classes, participants can improve their fitness, focus on their wellness and learn self-defense from a qualified group of instructors and trainers. It is also so important to note that instructors themselves actually identified as trans plus themselves and those who didn't were proud allies of the community. So this enabled me to actually open up about my own body image issues and anxiety around physical activity in groups with somebody that I could actually relate to and who would understand my own experiences. In fact, at the end of these sessions, many of us would just hang back and have a chat about mental health and shared experiences and seek advice from these instructors who were, for some of us, our only visible trans plus role models. So spaces like these are essential for young people who identify differently. When it comes to confidence and motivation, um, this is often lacking amongst young people. It's really easy to get stuck in this seemingly endless cycle. Um, when it comes to mental health and physical activity, being active requires motivation. But when you're feeling low, motivation is really hard to come by. And the frustrating part is knowing that getting involved in some sort of activity will help alleviate those feelings. So how do we bridge that gap and enable more young people to experience the benefits of physical activity. Lastly, time constraints. This generation is particularly vulnerable to poor mental health due to the prevalence of social media. We are constantly, constantly subject to pressure to meet impossible standards, such as being happy, beautiful, successful, healthy, productive and available 24-7. We are exhausted. The grind and the hustle culture that exists and that is perpetuated by the media leaves very little time for young people to think about their well-being. Between studying for exams, making money for rent, keeping ourselves fed, keeping in touch with our friends, where is the time for getting involved in physical activity? And when we do it, is it something that feels more like a chore or a punishment rather than something to enjoy? It doesn't have to be a hardcore session at the gym. It can just look like having a little dance in your kitchen while you're cooking your pasta or running up and down the stairs to just get that heart rate up. When it comes to recommendations, physical activity is a time that we can feel good about ourselves. We are getting the body moving and keeping an opportunity to be kind to our minds. It's a time for positive reinforcement and enthusiasm, not shaming or criticism. It's really important for coaches to recognize that all young people have different needs and abilities and backgrounds. For some young people, just showing up to a session is a huge achievement and deserves a huge pat on the back, while others might be enjoying to be challenged more and pushed more. Taking a person-centered approach is really essential in order to make physical activity sessions a safe and exciting space for young people today. Amazing, River, I mean, you put that so well and, and thank you so much for sharing your story there. Um, I guess just to build on your recommendations and drawing out some aspects from our report, as you mentioned, taking that person-centered approach is really key. Our audience scoping highlighted the need to create targeted programs. So it's really key that physical activity providers collaborate with mental health providers and individuals to co-develop these offerings. 
And I think similarly, uh, we identified an opportunity to develop combined services which support young people on waiting lists, especially those that may have been deemed not severe enough to access immediate support. The final recommendation that's really drawn out is that we need to take an evidence-based approach to working with young people, especially those that have experienced trauma. So currently only 16% of those that have experienced trauma would say that they enjoy participating in sport and exercise. So I think we've really acknowledged that we need to be sensitive to young people's past experiences and explicit about whether physical activity is trauma informed or not. So, for example, as a physical activity team, we've commissioned a three year PhD study into trauma informed approaches to physical activity. More information on this and mine's definition of trauma can be found in the full interactive report that we'll be sharing. I think that just leaves me now to say a massive thank you again to River for sharing your experiences. River and our other guests will be uh, taking part in the Q&A after. So if you have any questions for River or myself about this, CY, uh, about this young people's aspect, please do post them in the Q&A or through the chat. But for now, over to Carla to take us through our next audience. Well, thanks, James. And again, yeah, thank a massive thank you to James and River. That was so valuable. Um, so next we'll provide a snippet on the research findings around experiences of people living in poverty. And as I mentioned earlier, we know there's no one single way or no one singular term to describe poverty. It's different in every situation. So I suppose as organisations, we may use different language because it's important to use the terms that your participants you work for and your volunteers are comfortable with. To start with, uh, I wanted to share a couple of insights into the relationship between physical activity and mental health for people living in poverty. And Mind's research really tells us that there is the awareness of the positive benefits that physical activity can have on your mental health, but that awareness and, and barriers that people may face means it doesn't always translate into action. And in fact, our research highlights that physical activity can often be one of the first things that is dropped when, when life or mental health problems become worse. For those who do take part in formal and individual physical activity, such as walking, jogging, are the most popular as they're low commitment, low cost and flexible. For group activities, um, boxing and football were the most popular. What is most important and what is most integral is the setting of these activities. And the research tells us that opportunities should be local and community focused, especially as indications um, of the rising of cost of living has impact on our access to support networks and the affordability of activities to look after our mental health. Today, I'm delighted to be joined by Sam Sainsbury's, who is sport manager from the London based charity Single Homeless Project, who will share an insight into their sport programme, including barriers and recommendations for the sector. So morning, Sam. Um, great to have you. Thanks, Carla. Um, hi, everyone. Um, thanks for having me on. I'm Sam, uh, the Sport Manager at Single Homeless Project. Um, and I'm going to start by giving a little bit of an overview um, of the charity as a whole, and then I'll go into a bit more depth about our sport programme. Um, so, uh, yeah, Single Homeless Project is a London-wide homeless charity founded in 1977. Um, and our vision is of a society where everyone has a place to call home. Um, and the chance to live a fulfilling life. Um, so within SHP, there's an opportunities team, um, which consists of a music team, um, a gardening team, art, um, sport and psychotherapies. And um, I head up the sport. Um, so um, our sport project was formed in 2018 to provide physical activity opportunities um, to people experiencing or at risk of homelessness um, in order to improve their mental, physical and emotional wellbeing. And we introduced the project for a number of reasons. Um, firstly, our client group was spending on average 18 hours um, a day alone and sedentary in their rooms. Um, uh, we, they also had unmet mental and physical health needs. Um, and we also wanted to remove barriers for participating in physical activity for this particular target group. Um, and ultimately to, to break the cycle of homelessness. Um, so to address mental wellbeing, we created safe spaces for social connections and friendships. Um, and facilitated, uh, facilitated the re-engagement with health services and um, education and training opportunities. 
And we did this by providing a wide range of um, physical activity opportunities across 12 um, London boroughs, including um, uh, yeah, football, boxing, yoga, chair aerobics, um, cycling. Um, and we reached over 800 people so far. Um, I think the best way to perhaps um, see the impact of physical activity on mental health for this particular target group is through um, a project video. So we're going to play that now. You'd think that in a hostel with 20, 30 individuals, there'd be quite a lot of socialising going on. But lots of them spend days and days on their own in their room and they aren't active at all. And I think that just made it really clear to us that this was the project we needed to introduce. We offer a variety of different sports, from yoga to fishing, boxing. They're often very fun sessions. You just feel better about yourself, you know, getting involved. To explain it properly, they, they, they're fair with it. When you're doing the activity, even afterwards, you, you, you leave with a buzz, and, and then for the rest of it, I know I'm going to be fine. I'm just so grateful, you know, to know that I've got people to help me to keep my sanity together. I can never thank them enough. It's from the bottom of my heart, yeah? So I'm very grateful. Okay, so in terms of client experiences and perhaps the impact of the project, um, so 89% of um, people that we worked with improved their mental health, 92% um, improved in physical health. We've had 76% improve their stress, anxiety, and depression levels, 81% um, improving inactivity levels. Um, and we've also amazingly had 31% reduce their substance misuse, so um, alcohol and drug use. Um, and we also had a 15% increase in engagement with our education and training team. Um, so uh, you're looking for opportunities in um, employment, uh, yeah, education and training, just to help people further along their recovery path. Um, and yeah, it's all well and good having perhaps these tang tangible um, statistics, but I think the best way, again, to um, see the impact of physical activity on mental health is um, to hear from one of our clients themselves. So I'm going to introduce a little, well, a video of Andrew um, who talks about his experience with our project. Could you start with just introducing yourself and uh, saying? My name is Andrew. Um, I'm here at DHH Hospital with a gym facility. Here. Which um, sports sessions have you done? Um, that been on offer? Sports sessions? Uh, well, gym, <laughs> gym all day long. There's also the running with um, James. Um, he's one of, the, one, of the, one of the managers here. He works here. He's a great guy. And we do some um, training and running on Fridays, which is a good just job. Um, but the gym is twice a week. Great, great system here. And um, yeah. Um, 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 can you please talk to us um, about whether the sports project has impacted your mental health at all? Mental health, right. Okay, so um, in, in regards to that, um, I'm, I'm kind of like a bit, you know, iffy with my mental health, but when it comes to gym and like things that you can sort of like function on a good, social and awesome kind of impact level, your mental health really does sort of find a, um, a kind of a, um, like a, a a stable connection that that works with your inner you know you, you get positive about things especially when you feel good about doing the gym not only about what the rewards look like it's awesome in all regards so in in terms of mental health i would say it's a pro all day long how do you feel after the sessions after the sessions <laughs> tired <laughs> for one but um, no, but also um, like uh, an endorphin that comes out of doing the gym because there's, there's something about gym that just releases endorphin. You, you could say like for any drug you would know it would understand that, you know, gym has got that spark that makes you want to do it again. Um, your commitment to the sessions has been inspiring. What keeps you motivated to keep coming each week? Hey, the rewards all day long, of course. All I know is that Jim is, 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 is taking a good, good positive toll. Okay, so I hope that brings to life a bit more about our project. Yeah, we're very, very grateful for Andrew for um, speaking on that. Um, I'm now going to yeah, talk a little bit about the barriers to using physical activity for this particular target group. So um, firstly, there's a stigma in society um, that people experiencing homelessness don't want to get involved in sport um, or it's not a priority for them. 
Um, therefore, it hasn't been made as part of this core um, provision for homelessness. Um, but we found that it's not the case um, for, for many. Um, many of them actually do want to get involved. It's just they don't have the opportunities to do so. Um, so that links in to access. So um, there's a lack of sessions that are accessible to um, our client group uh, due to perhaps difficulty in advertising to them and therefore less awareness of it, um, but also due to financial constraints. Um, so not, not just in affording the sessions themselves, but also um, travel costs, um, if they're particularly far away or um, not being able to afford um, kit as well, um, or yeah, gym gear. Um, it's something that perhaps people uh, feel they'd be more comfortable um, going to session with the correct, um, well, not correct, but what they maybe feel is um, uh, uh, what's, what's to wear. Um, and this can all be quite off-putting for someone um, if they're thinking about perhaps uh, joining a session anyway, there might be uh, all these little barriers that put in, in place that, um, uh, yeah, they're not unable to do so. Um, in terms of physical health challenges, there's also uh, links in with substance misuse as well um, and many other long-term conditions from um, being street homeless, um, paired with yeah, the assumption that um, they can't get involved or it might be painful to do so. Um, and then there's also mental health challenges as well. So with social anxiety, reduced self-esteem and um, a fear of judgment, these are all things that will get in the way of someone um, feeling like they can get involved in sessions, particularly if it's a group session with, um, with many other people. Um, yeah, so now I'm just going to move on. I'm going to chat a little bit about the um, some of the solutions or recommendations to these barriers, specifically for our client group. Um, then Carla's going to talk um, about some of the wider recommendations that are on offer, sorry, that aren't specifically for our um, uh, the people that um, are living within our hostels. Um, so regarding stigma, um, it's obviously difficult to have a tangible solution um, for this, but we're working towards systemic changes amongst homeless provision. Um, so there are professionals in NHS social prescribing, prescribing physical activity for mental health. So it really begs the question if, um, yeah, if health professionals are um, advising this, then why isn't it within the, the core homeless provision? Um, so yeah, the work we're doing is trying to, to push for that. Um, in terms of access, there's, uh, uh, we, we provide all our sessions in-house or at least um, in community centres nearby, um, which breaks down the barrier of um, yeah, travel costs, um, people feeling like, um, yeah, feeling the confidence that they can go out and join perhaps a group session. Um, uh, in terms of the financial concern, um, concerns, we form partnerships within our communities um, that we feel is um, yeah, a great way to, to address this. Um, for example, we've got a partnership with Tecathlon who have kindly donated us um, and well, a number of donations of uh, gym gear and equipment, um, which uh, obviously helps massively and, and helps um, once we distribute it to the clients that we work with, um, it makes them feel a lot more um, able to get involved. Um, and we also provide so free sessions that on site with no travel. Um, regarding physical health challenges, so um, a big thing about our program is in, in providing inclusion in some form. Um, so whether that be um, people who are suffering some, from substance misuse, um, obviously we want to do things in the most safe way possible for them. But um, the yeah, we really don't like to turn people away. We felt that that's quite detrimental for people then engaging in the future. So um, whether whether that's even just watching or getting involved in like some warm up stretches before the session, um, it's just a great way for them to feel part of something. Um, and an example of that is obviously Andrew, um, him saying that he's he's reduced his substance use massively um, since being in the gym sessions, and um, yeah, just just having that opportunity to allow him to to get involved. Um, uh, yeah, we've seen we've seen great outcomes from it, um, and also we we look to adapt sessions as much as possible. So whether that's bringing in chairs if we want to do some chair aerobics, um, and equipping the session leaders, so the volunteers or freelancers or um, our sport team um, with uh, yeah be, being able to adapt to sessions to, to whoever, whoever comes through the doors um, and then regarding mental health challenges as well um, to combat social anxiety we uh, offer the opportunity for one-to-one -one sessions um, or for um, clients to bring along project workers um, particularly in group sessions it can be quite overwhelming and having someone there you trust or um, 
yeah, just makes them feel a bit more comfortable um, and able to get involved. Um, and it also offers the opportunity to um, for socialization and to grow in confidence as well. Um, so those are just some of the solutions for our particular client group. Um, and I'll hand over to Carla now. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Sam um, and Andrew as well, for your valuable insights and learnings from the SPARK project. It's, it's been really fantastic to hear the impact of the programme has had on the participants, um, but equally the learnings that we can take away and implement. So please do pop some questions in the chat for Sam. Um, I see there's already a couple. So just furthering on um, from Sam's um, presentation, um, some of your recommendations really complement the report findings and recommendations from our research. Our research was conducted with a, a wide range of people, um, for example, people in employment, accessing universal credit um, or benefits in, in visiting food banks. And the research identified that that real need for uh, affordable, accessible physical activity, which is rooted in local communities. Alongside the, the real need for increased collaboration between national and local physical activity and mental health providers, including making resources and support available for community organisations who are really directly engaging and supporting those communities. Our regional network programme may be a great opportunity for organisations to, to link in on a local to regional level. Whilst we know this, there's lots of great work happening already um, led by community organisations, um, our research highlights there needs to be more opportunities for people living in poverty over the age of 30. But in order to achieve this and to really support community delivery, there needs to be more investment and funding for community based organisations. And these opportunities need to be open and, and easy for local communities to apply to funding. They need to be easy, accessible, flexible and advertised in, in many ways so these organisations are aware of the opportunities that are available to them. This is only a, a small snippet of our research findings and really the beginning of the work and our work in this area. So please do check out the report after today's webinar um, and stay in tune with, with our work. Um, and again, a huge thank you to Sam and Andrew um, for supporting the webinar today. It's been fantastic to have you here. So we'll now move on and focus on our research findings around the experiences of people from racialized communities. And as I mentioned earlier, there's no one size fits all language for talking about race and identity. At Mind, we choose the term racialized communities in our strategy, but we know that our language and, and this language is evolving and it's constantly evolving. So we understand that group labels bundle many identities and experiences together and recognize we don't all face the same challenges. So it's really important to check in with your groups, your volunteers and coaches um, that you work with and use the language that they're comfortable with. You may notice some similarities and, and overarching themes as we share our insights into our strategic audiences. Our research tells us that people from racialized communities, that there is a positive benefit between physical activity and mental health as it provides spaces for really building trust, building community and connection. But we also recognize it's not the only way um, and there's other routes that may be more suitable. Physical activity also provides opportunities for organic conversation around mental health as the benefits are not directly labeled as mental health. So it can avoid uh, barriers such as stigma from self and others. In terms of activity, uh, walking is the most popular activity in our research alongside jogging, running, yoga, Pilates and Tai Chi. These activities have relatively low barriers to entry and they can be done on your own time, your own space and way and low cost. So today I'm delighted to be joined by Niall Sims, who is a PhD student from University of Leicester who will share his experiences around physical activity, um, any barriers and recommendations to the sector. So again, Benail, it's great to have you here this morning. Yeah, thank you for having me on there, Carl, and thank you for the introduction. Uh, my name is Niall Sims. Um, I am doing a PhD at the University of Leicester. And it's just regarding you know, young people's mental wellbeing when they're at professional sports as well. Um, I've also been working with MIND on their young black male mentor group. So we're just trying to really break down the stigmas that a lot of people from my community do find with regards to access and mental wellbeing services. And obviously I've had my own um, issues and journey with mental wellbeing as well. And I used to work as a personal trainer and I, uh, I used the 
and my personal training expertise and experiences to kind of help me through my problems and others as well. And uh, in my time as a personal trainer, I've seen a lot of barriers that have been used that you know people from racialized communities do face. Uh, one barrier that I've, comes up a lot is the cultural and religious norms. Uh, you know, sometimes attire that you know some religions have to wear can stop them from actually participating in sports. And as for like women from the Muslim community who have to having to wear hijab, it might be difficult for them to partake in certain type of sports. So that is a barrier that we tend to see here and there. And there's also huge expectations from family and home, meaning that people have to, you know, perhaps care for their children or, you know, the elders in their family. So that can drastically reduce the amount of time they have to go and, you know, pursue sports, especially organized sports where they're at a specific time of the day. You know, if this falls into, you know, a time when they, there might be a crossover with childcare or looking after, you know, their, their, the elderly in the house, it could be quite difficult for them to, you know, attend the sessions which is another issue that you know, comes up quite a lot, which can be quite prominent without having that flexibility. Um, another issue is the lack of access. Now, some areas don't have access to uh, certain sports, such as you know, the likes of golfing or you know, badminton, tennis. Some areas don't have that. We don't have the facilities there. So you know, being able to access these type of uh, memberships can be quite difficult. And that also feeds into sometimes uh, racial discrimination. You know, if you have to leave your area to go to another area, which is quite far away, you know, it might not be an area where, you know, racialized communities actually are. So, you know, if you enter a golf club or a tennis club and, you know, you're by yourself, you might feel a bit, I don't know, if maybe in fear or a bit, you know, it could be a daunting process going and asking for a membership form. So some people will tend to not even go and try and have a word to or even see if it's a possibility for them. I can go to the next slide, please. Yep. yep. And uh, the other barriers are the areas that are typically classed on the lower socioeconomic side tend to have less access to spaces such as gyms, leisure centers, etc. Um, in my experience of working in many different gyms, I have seen that, you know, I've worked at a gym and I'm not going to name the gym because it's a pretty well known gym, but I've been to that gym in my area, which is Craven, and it is fair to say rather ran down like it hasn't had an upgrade and you know it's pretty shabby to be fair but i've gone to an area such as wimbledon where they have the exact same gym with the exact same brand and it's had many uh, um, updates it's had facelifts it's had so many different classes allowed to it and this is a gym of the same brand so you know it, it's quite telling that a gym you know in different areas under the same brand may have different facilities and again that is something that can stop people from wanting to go to this gym because you know, if they're paying such a high fee for it and they're still getting really poor services or facilities, they might feel like, you know what, I don't want to join this gym. I don't feel confident working out here. Crime rate also tends to be higher, meaning spaces to train may not be attracted to people to train in, especially in the evening. Unfortunately, I'm not to generalize, but, but you know, crime is higher in areas of low socioeconomic standing. So people tend to not want to be outside after a certain time in fear of danger, you know, fear of any kind of crime that may happen. And also they may want to be at home to protect their family just in case you know, anything does happen. So that is another barrier that people tend to face. People from lower socioeconomic backgrounds may have jobs which require them to work unsociable hours, meaning time to train may be difficult to plan around. Again, you know, having set structure in times at some sports clubs may make it difficult for people to attend these sessions. And you know, they may not have time to training their hours where are most attractive to other people. So again, this could be another barrier. And more hours at work may be needed to help fund lifestyles. And with the cost of living crisis that we're seeing currently, people may sacrifice paying for things such as gym memberships. We're seeing nowadays people are, you know, deciding whether to you know, eat or have heat in this day and age. So you can imagine that the first thing that is going to be taken off of any kind of expense balance sheet is going to be gym memberships and stuff like that. So you know, that is where another reason why we're seeing a lot of people from racialized communities not take up a lot of activity as well. Um, yeah, if we can go to the next slide, thank you very much. Now, recommendations, um, partnerships between sport and physical activity and mental health sectors. With what you tend to see a lot now is, you know, football clubs, they're, ten, they're partnering up with the Mind and other community centers to hold some people football in the community, whereby they let people within the community come to training sessions of any age, of any able-bodied nature. They come in and they're able to be around like-minded people like themselves and feel confident 
with where they're training. Again, you know, having a club or, or institution's brand on a certain area or activity, it allows confidence within the racialized community to partake in these activities. Um, involving people with lived experience, again, I believe is quite key. Um, you know, I believe that the people that I mentor and I help out, they feel confident in me and talking to me and, you know, train with me because they know that I've been in a similar position to them. So when they are training with me or they want to come and talk to me about anything, they feel confident and knowing that I'm not going to judge them or I'm not going to, you know, report them to any type of service to, you know, they, where they feel that they may be marginalised. You know, they believe that they can talk to me openly and they can see that I've got had my own journey and come up the other side. So, they, you know, they feel confident in talking to me. And increasing accessibility to funding opportunities for programmes which specifically, which specifically benefit mental health by promoting physical activity. I think, you know, what is key is to highlight the benefits of physical activity and mental health. Uh, the benefits of, you know, keeping yourself healthy will also keep your mind healthy as well. And, you know, I believe that, you know, we need to spend more money on that. You know, I believe that prevention is better than cure. So if we can kind of highlight the benefits of training and, you know, investing in people with lived experience, the mental people through the process, I'm pretty sure we'll see a change in, you know, the uh, difficulties that a lot of people from racialized communities are seeing at this moment in time. So, um, yeah. Thank you very much for that, guys. Thanks, Naya. Um, and thank you so much for sharing and coordinating this webinar with us today. Um, it's been great to hear about your experiences and it's been so valuable. And I think your recommendations also really align a lot with what we're hearing from this research. Please do um, pop any questions for Niall in the chat. So just to conclude this section um, and to add to Niall's fantastic presentation, um, kind of building on the what now said around the real need for collaboration and strategic partnerships among the sport and physical activity and mental health sectors, including national and regional organizations providing support with finance, resource and training for community organizations. And when designing and, and delivering those activities, really involving people with, with lived experience and be led by people and the voices and needs of each community, rather than using a top down delivery model. We've also developed a guide in our toolkit on involving people with experience in your work, which may help. Finally, touching on a similar recommendation from the research on people living in poverty and ensuring there is support and funding available for developing programmes which specifically benefit uh, mental health by promoting physical activity and ensuring these are accessible to community organisations and groups. Our research tells us that Grassroots organisations describe existing funding schemes as partial towards registered charities and, and large scale organisations and restrictive for, for certain communities. So a huge thank you again to Niall. Um, your experience and your thoughts are so valuable that you shared with us today. It's been fantastic um, to share this space with you. Um, but you may have recognised there are some overarching themes across all of our strategic audiences. Um, so I'll pass back to James um, to touch on this. Brilliant. Thank you, Carla. And yeah, again, thanks to all our speakers. Um, it's great to see so many uh, questions coming through the chat and, and do please keep them going through the Q&A button. So we've run through each audience, we've shared some insights and recommendations and explored those barriers that came through our reports. But at the end of the online interactive report that we'll be sharing after this webinar, we also include a summary of some of those overarching themes that are common across all three audiences. So these common themes emerge in relation to people's experiences, their needs, their preferences around physical activity and mental health. I think some have already really been touched on by our speakers, but we just wanted to quickly draw on three particular themes that are highlighted across every research piece. So firstly, across all three audiences, those engaging in physical activity have recognised how participation provides an opportunity to build trusted relationships with other participants and coaches. This provides an avenue for more open conversations about mental health in a safe environment. Building on this, people with lived experience highlighted the additional benefits of accessing clubs and groups which have strong ties with the community. 
these again provide security and help to overcome some of those barriers to participation. As they're seen as more informal and less intimidating than some other forms of mental health support. Finally, I think what's apparent from our research, but also probably just further evidence by what we've heard this morning, it's really important that we continue to showcase the benefits of physical activity for our mental health through sharing people's lived experience and their stories. So only by engaging in a conversation with individuals can we co-create programs that address those huge barriers faced by these groups. As I think River and others have said, it's vital we all take that person-centered approach. I think we've really encouraged you uh, within your role and organization to think about how some of these recommendations can apply to your work and how you can engage with these audiences within your organization. But as a physical activity team at MIND, we've also taken on a huge amount from this scoping work. So I'm going to pass back to Carla to share a bit more about our next steps. Amazing. Thanks, James. Um, so what's next? So as a team, we've already started to implement the learning and recommendations in our work. Um, and as part of our Sport England System Partnership, we're undertaking best-based research and facilitating ideation sessions with national and regional organisations and really exploring the opportunities and next steps that Mind and Sport England can take in supporting our strategic audiences around physical activity and mental health. So please do watch the space, um, keep in touch with us um, and sign up to our newsletter by contacting sport at minds.org.uk. But also we have a wealth of information and resources you can access by our web page, which is minds.org.uk forward slash sport, which includes the summary report we have shared with you today. Again, a huge thank you to all of our speakers, um, but we now have time to open up the virtual floor for anyone who has any questions um, around the report or for our guest speakers. So I'll hand over to Sam, who will be our wonderful host for the Q&A. Thanks, Carla. Thanks, James. And thank you to all of our amazing speakers. That was fantastic. Um, so I'm Sam, Physical Activity Operations Manager at MIND. And thank you so much for everyone posting uh, questions into the Q&A and chat box. Um, we probably won't get a chance to go through all of them, but what we will do is we'll take some of them offline and we'll follow up uh, in our email on the back of the webinar with the answers as well. So apologies, we won't get through all of them. The first question I think we'll just quickly cover is from Rachel Active Knots, which is around the research into young people. Did it talk about exercise rather than physical activity or, or movement? Very good question. I think everyone in this sports sector is having the debate about what terminology we use. So the researchers uh, used a, a broad range of terms around physical activity so that it wouldn't limit responses. And then it was dictated by what young people were using, particularly within the focus groups, what terms they would use, they would then uh, uh, use that. What I will do is I'll just put in the chat a link to the full report, which may provide a bit more information on that. Um, but I was just going to say, River, could I just bring you in here and just ask, like, do you have a preference in terms of what terminology we use in terms of sport, physical activity or movement? I personally really like movement because I think, as I mentioned when I was talking about, like, it doesn't have to be a hardcore gym session. I feel like there's a lot of pressure on young people to sort of zone out and just do something really intense where you can actually like really enjoy and do it mindfully. So as I mentioned, like I personally think, right, I'm cooking some food. I'm just going to blast some music and dance around. Um, so yeah, I think movement's great. Like I've got my Fitbit and that motivates me because um, I can just see the steps going up and I'm dancing around my kitchen. Um, but yeah, I think exercise does have some like more like negative connotations because it seems to be sort of more disciplined, but I think it's, yeah, again, it comes down to the individual and what they prefer. Brilliant, thanks River. Um, I'm now gonna jump to James at UK Youth. Your second question around, is there any evidence about whether it is physical activity or the chance to socialize or both that has the beneficial effect? And um, 
one of the things I want to just um, say is from our Get Set to Go programme, so this was delivered between 2015 to 2021 uh, with our local minds. Uh, it, there was a, a broad range of motivations for getting active. And one of the big things was around the chance to socialise that sense of community. So what I'm going to also do, I'm going to put more links in the chat. So we've got two um, evaluation reports. Um, sorry, I know lots of evaluation reports going in the chat, but um, you can find out more information uh, there. But then I was just going to say in terms of, Sam, could I bring you in here? In terms of for your programme, do you find in terms of promoting physical activity, um, it is really important to promote the health and well-being benefits of physical activity and that chance to socialise? Yeah, definitely. I think um, especially, particularly with the chance to socialise as well, um, a lot of our clients um, that get involved in our sessions isn't about um, not necessarily really getting stuck into um, a sport that they have always enjoyed. It's about um, just coming along, meeting people, trying something new sometimes. Um, and yeah, we, we find massive benefits within the socialisation side of things. So when we frame um, how we uh, are like advertising the sessions, it often is um, Sometimes it is even like come have a cup of tea, have a chat, and then we'll do a bit of chair based exercise, that sort of thing. Um, regarding the health and well being side as well, um, so our team initially for the, um, so we initially funded by Sports England for, Sports England for a three year project. Um, and it was a sport and health team where we included health checks and things within um, the within the offer as well. So um, within the sessions or, or um, outside of sessions as well. Um, and yeah, that was again another way of like bringing people in and like making it a more holistic approach about health and about um, improving and well, taking your health into your own hands as well and um, and having that sort of autonomy with it. Um, now with our sort of new project, the last couple of years we've expanded slightly off with our sports and health have become well they've grown basically and become kind of two separate teams that still have that interlink. So there's still referrals between our like health team and um, and our sports team. Um, but yeah, the growth of it has meant that um, it is still with this uh, one big team of health, sport and health, but um, we've just widened our offer with that. But yeah, it's, it's definitely um, it's definitely good to focus on that socialisation, that health, um, and not just solely on the sport. I think um, that way we've we've definitely widened who we who we've got involved, and um, yeah, again, even um, yeah, saying about that that stigma around sport or exercise, um, it breaks down that if you if you come for a, Come, come along for a bit of a, um, a bit, bit of a chat, a bit of a um, socialization, build up those relationships, and support is then there on offer as well. But, um, yeah, that's what I'd say on that. Brilliant, thanks, Sam. Really, really valuable. And then I think we've just got time for one more question. Like I say, we will take these questions away and provide more context to them. But um, a really good question uh, from Patrick. Uh, so, what have you found effective? design delivery and review um, i'm just quick going to put in the chat we in our uh, mental health and physical activity toolkit we have a dedicated guide on how to involve people with lived experience and mental health problems in in your work so i'll post that we will uh, include it in the follow-up comms but i just want to come to you there Niall. you've done a quite a bit of work here you yourself have been involved in quite a lot of work at mind around co-design what do you think is the best and most effective way to involve uh, people in the designing of sessions? Um, oh, I think the best way is just to, you know, ask the question and ask what they want to do, you know? Sometimes we might believe, oh, we know what's best for everyone, but, you know, it's best to collaborate with the people that you're working with. So if you talk to someone and ask what they're good at, what they enjoy, what they're comfortable with, what they're uncomfortable with, what you tend to find is that you can produce a session that's best for everyone. You know, you don't want to take someone through a session where they are hating it because, again, that's going to make them feel worse. You know, and you want to make it almost that it's the journey that they're on and not so much the, the destination. So it's not about how much weight you lose or how fit you get or how much you can bench or, you know, deadlift, but just seeing the progress weekly and, you know, taking baby steps to achieve your goal. That's the main thing. I love that. That's a brilliant answer, Niall. Thank you so much. And I think that corresponds to a lot of the questions we got there is, is it really speaking to the participants and, and ensuring they're involved. 
Um, sorry, that's all the time we've got, uh, all the time we've got for these questions. Uh, but like I say, we will answer them and send it out with the follow up communications. Um, I'll hand back to James. Thanks, Sam. The final pass of the baton. Um, and yeah, thanks so much. We'll definitely uh, follow up with those links as well. I know a few people are really interested in some of that information we've just shared. I guess just before we close, um, we wanted to remind you that when you signed up for this webinar, we asked you three questions about your understanding of all the audiences that we've spoken about today. And we'd love to know if this webinar has helped to increase, I guess, the overall level of knowledge you have around these audiences. So we're going to ask the same three questions via a poll now. Um, would really appreciate if everyone could just complete that before you uh, leave. And I think as you're completing those questions, I just wanted to use this opportunity to say a final thank you to our guest speakers, to River, to Sam and to Niall. I think as highlighted through all the research, it's absolutely paramount that mind and the sector amplifies the voices of people with lived experience. It's been really powerful to hear all three of you speak today. So thank you so much for your openness, your honesty and for helping us out today to deliver this webinar. And finally, um, as you uh, finish up and, and answer the poll, a thank you to you, to everyone listening and attending our webinar today and those also watching via the recording. We hope you found it useful. Um, as mentioned, the whole interactive report will be circulated and will embed some of the recording from today's webinar. So please do share far and wide, share with colleagues, share across the sector and continue to keep the conversation going with us. Um, we'd be really interested to continue linking in. But for now, as we close, um, make sure you take some time for a break over lunch. Uh, it's sunny outside where I am in London. I hope it is where you are. So get out for some fresh air, uh, get moving. Um, as River said, it's so important that we will have a bit of a dance or a walk uh, to keep active and to look after our mental health. But from me, uh, from Carla and from the whole physical activity team at Mind, have a great rest of the day. Thank you so much for joining and we look forward to continuing the conversation with you as we move through this journey with all our three strategic audiences.